Right, we're going to dismiss the kids' church at this time. Please open your Bibles up to Revelation chapter 12. Thank you for that special. Revelation chapter 12. And if you're part of the kids' church, you can be dismissed. A little short on kids this week. I think it has to do with Thanksgiving. Uh, it's an exciting time of the year. And, uh, it's fun to be in the holiday season. We celebrate holidays. You know the greatest holidays um, that we Americans celebrate all have to do uh, with really God's goodness toward us. You know, really in, in the United States there's three major holidays, aren't there? There's uh, Christmas, Thanksgiving, and Easter. And all of them are really Christian holidays, times when we celebrate uh, God's goodness. And Thanksgiving is very, very special uh, because... It, for, it, it, first of all, I'll be honest with you, the thing that I'm first most grateful for is just heritage. To, to be in a nation where our founding fathers, the first thing that they thought to do when they survived the first winter was we need to, we need to have a time of thanksgiving. And then uh, just a couple years later the, at Plymouth, they had a, a major thanksgiving for just, we survived and we look like we're going to make it through the winter and we have something to be thankful for. Let's thank God. And then after our nation um, had won the war for independence and survived, really against insurmountable odds, the first thing the Congress asked the, uh, the president to sign, the first thing they asked him to do was a proclamation for Thanksgiving. And that, what a wonderful truth that is. After the Civil War, which was the most tumultuous greatest turmoil that our nation has ever been through. When it came to an end, uh, one of the first things that uh, President Lincoln did was made a proclamation for Thanksgiving and made it a national holiday that our nation thanks God for, uh, for what He's done. I'll tell you something. Difficult times are the thing that ought to make us the most grateful, the most thankful. And so I do enjoy this season of the year, and we're going to have a number of events where we celebrate uh, after Thanksgiving, we'll be celebrating the birth of Christ, the coming of Christ, and uh, we certainly make a big deal out of the resurrection as well. These are just wonderful things. And it, it's a little tragic, isn't it, that we've, we've, lost, we've lost our country to the degree that literally all three of these holidays are celebrated all around our nation, but most people don't really understand the significance of them the way that we do. And so they, they're very, very special for us. And uh, let's, let's make sure that we're thankful. Uh, we ought to always be thankful. And we'll see a message, have a message on that this afternoon in Miami Beach. All right, are you in Revelation chapter 12? Is that where I asked you to go? All right, pick a chapter. That's a good one. Uh, let's, <laughs> let's go there. Um, I want to read to verses 1 through, um, 1 through 9. And uh, we're going to just look at some... We're going to kind of look at a microcosm where I, uh, instead of looking at the events that are, that are in the future, which we will briefly today after we read our text, we're also going to just look at some practical application. We're going to see God in our text here today and some application from that. First one of Revelation 12. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. Well, that's mysterious until you read further. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head, heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And as she and she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up into up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. That computes out to about three and a half years. Verse seven, and there was a war was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels, and prevailed not neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. 
he was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And I, I will stop there. Father, I just pray that this morning that as we look at our text, that you would help us to understand the events that will take place in the future. But God as well, I pray that you would help us to see you and to see what's happening right now in our lives. And I pray that you would help us to be able to be overcomers and victorious. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, couldn't you, um, in your imagination, could, can you visualize this description that John makes? You know, you, you see a great wonder in heaven, a woman. And uh, she's clothed with the sun, and she has the moon under her feet. So this is really, you know, just... Can you imagine just the um, the dr the dramatic effect of this, the, the significance? You know, when we see when we see heavens, what do we think of? Have you ever you ever been in a place where there's real darkness? I mean, not South Florida, and they had the privilege maybe even of being on a mountaintop at nighttime and and uh, and seeing stars and seeing just the heavens. You ever just seen how vivid it is? What are your personal thoughts when you see the heavens? Somebody throw out something. Let's see if we think. It's breathtaking. Okay, it's breathtaking. It's amazing. It's it's vast, isn't it? I mean, it's just. I mean, it's it's beautiful, and it's vast. My personal thought when I look into the heavens, and when I really begin to look at the things that God has made, uh, I think like the psalmist, "What is man that thou thinkest of him?" And, who is man that thou art mindful of him? You know, the, the, those sort of thoughts come to me. I'll tell you what, I really feel is small. I feel insignificant. You know, that's that's my personal thought. Whenever I look, and whenever I look at creation, but especially when I look into space, and I don't know if you've ever been to one of the planetariums or something like that, particularly one from a Christian perspective, where you just look at the vastness of space and and our references like in Job and in the Old Testament of the Scripture to the planets and the galaxies and, and uh, just, just to how big God is. And here we see a woman, and later on we, we see that she has a child and we see that he's caught up uh, to God and to His throne. and He was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. There's no question about the child. Is there the Son? Is there? Not at all. That's Jesus. That's God's Son. And uh, he's, he's the son of God, and he is the seed of David. He's the, the, the seed of promise. And he is the, pro the promise of God's blessing to Abraham and Isaac and to Jacob. And so then who is the woman? Israel. It's Israel. It's Israel. It's very, very plainly Israel. And again, we saw in chapter 7 a few weeks ago, didn't we, when we saw that before God allowed the earth to be hurt, or any of the major judgments at the hand of God to begin, that first of all, God had sealed 12,000 of 12 tribes, 144,000 individuals, which had the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not able to, they were not, uh, able to be hurt by God's judgments because they were sealed. They were protected from it. It is, uh, again, I, I, I just, we need to really get this in our heads, how important it is for us to realize that the hand of God in judgment, that type of persecution, that type of tribulation, is not what believers go through. God's wrath is never directed at His children. Do you hear me today? Amen. When God looks at you, my friend, be reminded, remember how that God sees you. You know, I see myself, even uh, under God's grace, even covered by the blood of Jesus, I see myself as a worm. And that's really what I am. But when God sees me, it is not because of naivety. It's not because uh, He doesn't know what's going on. But it's because of what He's done on my behalf. God sees Jesus. And He sees the blood of Christ covering me. Amen. He sees the covering. He knows what's under the covering, but He sees the covering. And the blood of Jesus Christ, my friend, is of infinite worth, infinite value. And that's how God sees me. And that's how God sees you if you're His child. If you've received Jesus, you've received that sacrifice where Jesus died for sin on His cross and was buried and rose again and where salvation was freely offered that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved from what? Well, from God's wrath. God's wrath 
has never been intended for his children. Uh, God's wrath for his children was directed at his son. I almost want to say misdirected because we deserve God's wrath. But instead of judging us, he judged his son in our place. And Jesus died for our sin. And so the notion that these cataclysmic end time events where God is just pouring out his wrath on wicked, unbelieving men, my friend, it's, it's, it's just mistaken in its entirety. I don't read Revelation with fear for myself. I don't read Revelation and think, wow, what if I'm you know, part of these events? These events are not for me. I read Revelation with fear for the, those that will be in them. And, and by the way, that ought to be the, the right tone, the right attitude. We ought to understanding and knowing the future of those individuals who refuse Jesus as their Savior, we ought to be fully aware. Is that my phone? How could my phone, excuse me, how could my phone have done that? <coughs> I want to defend myself a little bit. Uh, I do leave uh, my phone on vibrate or ringer because it's also the church phone, and sometimes people are trying to get here. So you'll see me actually answer my phone in church. And that's acceptable behavior only for me. That's only okay for me to do. Uh, just so uh, everybody knows, because if somebody's trying to get here, somebody's got to answer the phone, and it goes to my phone. And so that's the only reason I do that. It's not because, you know, um, well, whatever. Anyway, <laughs> just, just in case you ever see me, like, man, I can't believe Pastor answered the phone during church. By the way, if you ever call me during a service, I will answer the phone. And it'll be on speakerphone on the microphone, just so you know. If a church member ever calls me, and I'll say, hello, is anybody there when I did that to Devin Frost? Some years ago, he was in a different time zone, and he called on a Wednesday night service, and I answered the phone. Hey, what are you doing? Uh, oh, we're just here. We're just getting together here. And he goes on and on and on. And he finally realizes that he's speaking on speakerphone in church in the service. He's never called me in church ever Again, and so, <laughs> you can call me if you have a good reason to, and I'll answer the phone during church. But just know, I'll answer if you call me during church. <laughs> okay, I'll think something terrible has happened to you, and I need to answer, or I will answer just to uh, give you a very, very difficult time. All right, sorry about the, my phone doing whatever it just did. I don't know what that was. Now, coming back to where we were at a moment ago, we're talking about God's judgment and God's wrath. And God's wrath has never been intended for His children. But you and I ought to understand and know that the death on the cross was terrible. And so, God's wrath is not a light thing. And you and I also ought to understand and know that the future destruction of the wicked is terrible. And we do not rejoice in that. You know, the idea of being glad or saying God judge the wicked quickly is so contrary to the nature of God Himself. The very reason God has reserved or withheld final judgment for every unbeliever is because He's long-suffering, He's merciful, and He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And you and I, when we see these future judgments, we ought to be like a loving sibling. You ever... You ever grown up with siblings and one of them was in trouble? And you kind of felt their pain a little bit? You know, you got to stick with your kind, you know. you got to <laughs> support your, your peer group. And I, I don't think I was ever happy when my brother or sister were, were paddled. Uh, I don't think I ever rejoiced in that because I, I related to it a little bit. And I felt like, you know... <laughs> If mom had found out, <laughs> there go I. Or if I hadn't set my brother up, <laughs> he went, you know, you're really good at this, and so you do the sneaking on this one. Or you know, If you ever had the little brother, you know, that you could talk into doing things for you, and then he got busted, and you're standing back like, okay, I hope he doesn't rat me out. You know? Well, I feel that way about judgment, honestly. I feel when someone is going to face God's terrible wrath, I feel like I'm not any better than they are. Amen. Not any better, I'm not any different than they are with the exception that I've bowed to God and I've received the free gift. I've received God's love. And by the way, I want to get ahead of myself, but our message this afternoon, we're going to see that the reason 
why people refuse God's grace, God's love, is because of ungrateful hearts. Ungrateful hearts. And so it's important for us to realize this is a terrible event. I don't wish it on anyone. Now there's this catastrophic event in heaven. And of course we recognize that verses 2 uh, down to verse 5, we recognize, we know that's Jesus, right? So we recognize that this portion of this description of, of Israel and the child being caught up to His throne, we understand that's the resurrection. That is what's referred to in Daniel chapter 9 where, uh, he's, where the Messiah is cut off, but not for Himself, but for the sins of the people. Does everybody get that? Everybody understands that? You can study Daniel 9, look down to, all the way down to verse 27 to see that. But here's something that's interesting or, or worth our noting. That's in verse 5. She brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Now, was to rule, past tense, present tense, future tense. Well, was is past tense, but he was to rule. That's actually a future tense reference there. I don't mean to uh, confuse you, but we see we're, we're, we're taken into a middle of a story where we see this woman who is Israel, and we see that you know the, the 12, of course, the, the um, was the 12 crowns, or, or a crown of 12 stars on her head, those stars. Remember Joseph's illusion? To the stars, the moons, and the and the and uh, this this is clearly Israel, and clearly the part where the man child has been born has taken place. But has Jesus ever ruled with a rod of iron? No, no, no not yet. You know, people that that try to say, try to say, you know, this is this is God's kingdom. We're all part of God's kingdom, and they talk about establishing Christ's kingdom and so forth. That sort of kingdom theology, my friends, very erroneous, very very mistaken. Uh, it'll be literally Jesus, and a, a rod of iron is an unbending rod. It's an unmoving rod. This is the idea here is is not mercy. The idea here is merciless. I'm always reminded when I see how merciful God is that his the days of his mercy are, will come to an end. The days of His mercy are going to come to an end. There's a certain point. There's a point when Jesus is going to deal with man with a rod of iron. There's a point when He's going to deal with the wicked by speaking their destruction. Friend, you and I who live in this great day of grace and mercy need to be very, very mindful that there's a certain time when God's grace and God's mercy runs out. When it's over. And we know this is a future event. Jesus has never ruled with the rod of iron. Uh, God's, God's hand is, is uh, a hand of chastisement for believers. And God, but God has never destroyed the wicked. We've always asked the question, or the question has always been asked of God, why doesn't God do something about evil? The fact is, is that it's coming. It's coming. We've been introduced to that now in, our, in the text. We were introduced to national Israel. We're very, very made, plainly made to understand in Revelation without any question at all that this is not the church that's being referred to here. This is Israel. Believing Israel. It's not all of Israel. It's a remnant of Israel. And uh, we will actually, uh, we can actually see this in verse 6. The woman fled in the wilderness where she hath a place of prepared of God that they should feed her there. A thousand two hundred and three score days. How many? How many uh, years is a thousand uh, three hundred and two score? Well, it's three sixty, right? Or it's three hundred sixty. In some calendars, some of the calendars would use a three hundred sixty year calendar, and then make up for the extra five and a half or five and whatever, five and a quarter days in the calendars with the three sixty five. And so this is three and a half years. So how long is Israel believing Israel? Uh, this hundred forty four thousand. How long are they going to be kept? from being destroyed. Three and a half years. And so that would, bring us, that would bring us to the end point of the Great Tribulation. So literally, for and let, me, and let me deal with this as well because I've heard individuals whom I respect and who I believe 
know the Word of God very well, have heard them say, there's no one that becomes a believer during the tribulation. That just isn't so. just isn't so at all. First of all, 144,000 of the 12 tribes of Israel certainly are believers. These are not individuals that God has arbitrarily said, well, because of your nationality, I'm going to spare you judgment. No, my friend, all you have to do today is to meet individuals who are Israel according to the flesh to realize there are many who do not wish to be spared God's judgment. They do not wish uh, to be part of God's plan. This has always been the case, hasn't it? There have always been individuals who, are, who could be heirs to the promise who have profaned it. Yeah, look at the example of the difference between Jacob and Esau. And Jacob was not a stellar uh, person of stellar character and disposition, was he? His literal name means deceiver, liar, trickster. And I mean, literally his name means, you know, con artist. Jacob was no saint, <laughs> to put it mildly. But the difference between Jacob and Esau was that Jacob wanted the inheritance. See, the inheritance wasn't merely land. The inheritance was God. And Jacob wanted that. When he wrestled with the angel, he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. He wanted God. He desired God. Friend, it's amazing, isn't it, how God will take a person who really otherwise is entirely irredeemable. And because of their desire for God, God can redeem them. God can do something with them. And these, are, these will be the redeemed during the tribulation period. These will be saints. We know, of course, that there will be way more, uh, way more national Israel alive at this time, and tragically only 144,000 of them will be the ones who are the part of these believers. But they will be, uh, they will be respondent to uh, the witnesses and the, the, the message of the witnesses, and they will lead a great host that follows the Savior. Now, if you'll permit me this, this morning, um, instead of then looking just at future events, if you'll permit me just to draw some applications from our text today that are realities that we face today and that actually are helpful for us. <coughs> if you're a believer in Jesus, you won't be here for this. You won't be part of this. But you're here now. And there are some realities, there are some truths in our text today that ought to help you, first of all, to know God better and to know how to live today. The first one of those this morning that we could look at would be that there's a devil. There's a devil. You know, sometimes I think we're a little bit naive about the devil. Or, uh, you know, I wouldn't say today that nobody here believes in the devil. I think we all do. Uh, I think all of us could quote Scripture, couldn't we, about the prince of the power of the air. I think we could all talk about the, the devil who's a, a roaring lion. He's walking about seeking whom he may devour. I think all of us uh, could understand that, but I think sometimes the pure evil of the Satan is something that we overlook. How evil the devil is. And I just want to say here today, this individual who, if he could, would cut off the seed of the woman. If he could, would have destroyed the plan of redemption. Why was the devil complicit? Why is he complicit in the death and the cross? Why is the devil for that? Why was it for those three days before the resurrection, the devil is feeling as though there's some sort of triumph that he's achieved? I'll tell you why. Because he's evil. That's why sometimes we, we, just, we, we, we forget how real the Satan is. How real the devil is. And as we forget it, we forget about how real what he's trying to do actually is. You know, I, when, I, when I was a child, I used to wonder why the devil even cared about people. I'm thinking, if I'm, if I'm Satan, first of all, why would he rebel against God? But That's the first question. But the second question is, why does he even bother with man? We're inferior to him in every way. You know that, don't you? I mean, the devil doesn't see man as competition one-on-one. -on -one. The idea of, of some person, the Bible says we're supposed to resist the devil, you know, flee from us. But it's, no, we're not saying, in my name I resist you, Satan. No, we resist him uh, through the blood of Jesus Christ. We see that in our context here today. The reality of it is we're no match for him. And a person, uh, he's not just a bully who wants to pick on somebody. The reason the devil hates you is because God loves you. You hear me today? The, the reason uh, the devil hates you is because you are God's prized creation. 
It's incredible to me that God did create man to be lower than the angels, but He did not create the angels for fellowship. He created man for fellowship. He did not make the angels in His image. In our context today, we see, uh, and even in Revelation, we see the term uh, beast used a lot, the word thurion, which simply means wild animal or means an animal, but not person, not a person. And uh, the word beast is, you know, sometimes we, we think, we look at these descriptions of how terrible the beast is that the dragon gives power to in chapter 13. But the reality of it is, is that the difference between the beast, which is just a word that means animal, and us is that God made us in His image. And even the Satan, as mighty and powerful as he is, and as much as we're not a match for him, he's not loved by God like you and I are. He's not special to the heart of God like you and I are. He's not created for fellowship to, with God like you and I are. The reason the devil hates you is because he hates God. And if you think that you know there's some sort of, well, you know, the devil and I, and there are individuals who literally think the devil's good to them. We see in context uh, individuals that worship the dragon. Why? Well, they're deceived about who he is and what his purpose for them is. My friend, you take you side with the devil, you've sided against God. You've taken there's a line drawn, good and evil, and you step over to the evil side, you've just put yourself on the devil's side, but more than that, you put yourself against God. And you and I, from our context today, looking at this future event and this desire to literally wipe out a people, wipe out Israel. Why? Well, because God loves them. That's why. And can I say today that in context in the prophets, we see that the Israel is the apple of God's eye. Any attempt to wipe out Israel, my friend, is satanic in its origin. Any attempt to wipe out or even be against national Israel, my friend, is satanic in its origin. I am not in that statement making a de declaration that Israel is saved. She is not. But God has a plan for Israel. And there are going to be Israelites who, just like today, become believers. In that day, will become believers as well. And it's actually tragic that we only see 144,000. It's actually not that many compared, I think a lot more, uh, I think probably, and this is just my surmising, but I think today a lot more uh, Jews, Israelites, get saved than that. I've never been to a church where there weren't saved uh, Israelites. Never have been. Never been in a church where there weren't Jews who were believers. And so I know there are lots of them. There are certainly a lot more than I know, uh, particularly because they find their identity with the Lord Jesus. These are some practical truths that we remember uh, that we ought to remember that the devil is real. And then the second thing is that the devil's on earth. The devil's here. Uh, he, of course, has access here in heaven. And uh, I look at verse, if you will, verse um, 7. <coughs> there was war in heaven, and Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, and neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent. Okay, do you guys know who, who's being talked about here? The serpent in the garden, the dragon, called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And so we see here that, of course, this would be similar to what we would uh, see in Job when, the, uh, when the, the devil appears before God. And makes the accusation against Job. Up to this point, the Satan has access to accuse the brethren. He has access to God. And he is roaming to and fro in the earth. He is walking about seeking whom he may devour. But I'm telling you at this point, he has been banished from heaven. By the way, there's something interesting here to note as well, isn't there? The fact that he's not fighting Jesus. He's not fighting God in heaven. He's fighting Michael and his angels. And Michael and his angels throw him out. Isn't it wonderful when God says he will give his angels charge over thee, speaking of Jesus, of course, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone? I believe that we do have uh, angelic beings on earth, representatives for God. And God is greater, and God's, God's angels are greater uh, than the devil and his angels. We recognize the devil as a 
is a great power that we're no match for him. But my friend God and his angels, including Michael, are a match for the Satan. We know that Michael would say, the Lord rebuke thee. Uh, we, would, we know that the, the angels would rebuke the Satan, the dragon, in the name of Jesus. But the reality of it is, is that they have great authority and great power. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Not only is Jesus greater, but his representatives are greater. And I'm glad for that. My friends, sometimes you and I overestimate evil. If you're taking notes, take a note of that. Sometimes you and I overestimate evil. Evil's great, isn't it? It's terrible, isn't it? Doesn't it seem sometimes as though great is so much greater than you or I? And yet, isn't it incredible how many times evil is thwarted? Even on earth, even in this life, man, I'm telling you, the intentions of evil have been so great, and, and yet... For, for whatever reason, God will not allow it. it just It's only allowed so much, and it's stopped. You and I, first of all, need to not underestimate the devil, but we also need to not overestimate the devil. It's important for us to be balanced as believers. Listen, I don't want to speak too much about him here today. I don't want to describe him. I don't want to talk about him, because I believe that is literally what the Scripture talks about when it says neither give place to the devil. We're not giving him a place here today. We want the devil uh, here today to know that he may uh, be great in comparison with us, but he's nothing with God, and that's who, that is who side we are on. We're on the winning side. We're on the winning side. We're on the Lord's side. And so uh, we see as well that Christ's kingdom is real. Look at verse 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now has come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God, and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before God day and night. What a frustration to weak man that the accuser is allowed to accuse. It gets us sometimes, doesn't it? The accusations. The truth is, when you're covered by the blood, how many accusations hold? How many accusations stick to the accused? How many? Zero. None of them do. But it troubles us that he's an accuser, doesn't it? <coughs> the Bible here calls him not the accuser of the wicked. It calls him the accuser of the brethren. The accuser of the brethren. And friend, here is some valuable information for you and me to pick up. First of all, he may be the accuser of the brethren, but we're innocent. At least that's how it comes out. <laughs> uh, you ever received mercy when you didn't deserve it? <laughs> you ever uh, felt like, well, I would uh, go to court, only the thing is, is that, or I would plead, I would plead innocent, only thing is, I'm not. You ever been pulled over and that was the case? I mean, you wouldn't have been speeding on purpose, but you actually were. Not on purpose, it just happened. You know, you didn't know the speed limit or your car drove faster than you wanted it to, or something like that happened. But the reality is you got pulled over, and you well, right when you saw the blue lights go on, you looked at your speedometer, and there that, that speed limit sign pops up. Like, it's, it's nowhere to be seen. It's behind a tree or something, but as soon as you see blue lights, bam, the speed limit sign shows up in front of you, and there it is. You see your speed, you, speed, you see the law, and you realize, guilty. And so... I don't know what it is about law enforcement, but they have this, um, this uh, sinister pleasure they derive from asking you why. Isn't it fun? Parents do this too. I think there's just something innate in human character when you know you've got somebody to ask them for a reason why they've done wrong, right? But uh, you know how fast you're going, first of all. Like they're, they're inviting you to uh, lie to them or um, at least tell them something they won't believe even if you told them the truth. You know how fast you're going? No, I don't. They don't believe that. Uh, you know, if you tell them, yes, sir, this is how fast I'm going, you know what the next question is? Any reason why you're going so fast? <laughs> why are you asking me that? Well, actually, <laughs> I'm above the law. That's the only reason. <laughs> What's the right answer to a question like that? You know, it, it doesn't matter if, if uh, there's a personal emergency or whatever, you still shouldn't be speeding. That will be their answer. They won't be like, well, in that case, carry on. You know, that only happens in the movies, and I'm not sure I've ever seen it happen in the movies. But uh, that's, you know, that's the sort of thing 
that we make. Why, why, what is it about that? So you're guilty. You know what I say when I get pulled over? I just tell them the truth. I just tell them, yeah, you know, yeah, you're right. Uh, I, was going, I was going this fast, and you know what the speed limit is? Um, I think it's this, you know, right there. I got pulled over one time at a speed trap in the middle of the night in uh, Jackson, Tennessee. Here's Jackson, Tennessee. Some place, there's a little hole in the wall kind of place. And you're coming around a curve, coming down kind of a sort of a hilly region. You're coming down a hill, and I was in my old Volkswagen Rabbit, and you always take advantage of downhill to get up speed because you only have like 40 horsepower in the car, so you want to get up the next hill. So you come around the curve, and then all of a sudden, like on the downhill slope, there's like a 65, 55, 45, 55, you know, and it's an old four-speed. I just let the engine do the braking and sail right through the speed limit, and blue lights hit me. I mean, it's just like literally... The police officer said, he said, he said, yeah, right there, the speed limit is 65, and right there, it's 55, and right there, it's 45. And I think it went down to like 35 or 25. It was just like, <laughs> boom! It's like that. You go down the hill, and so does the, you go down, and so does the speed limit. Like, literally, like, boom, 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 like, speed limit. It was clearly a speed trap. And uh, what are you going to say? No. I didn't say anything. And uh, you know what he told me? He said, if I were you, I wouldn't drive on this highway. I'd go, he gave me directions to get on an interstate and to get out of there and, and kindly didn't give me a ticket. <laughs> but that's the only way I've ever come out. In other words, I've come out innocent, not because I was, but because of something else. Because of a merciful judge. It's the only reason. I've gone to court before and, and uh, you know, I make it sound like I get tickets all the time. They just make a big impression on me because it doesn't happen very often. Seriously. Uh, I, I don't get tickets. I don't have anything on my record, and I haven't since I was, I think, uh, 19 or something like that. I only had one then. Um, but uh, whenever I've gotten a ticket, I just go to court, and I tell the judge, yes, I was guilty, uh, but, you know, I'm just asking for leniency. And I've always gotten it. I've always gotten leniency. I always had them say, okay, all right, good enough. And uh, they... They make the ticket go away. I'm appreciative. I've never been innocent, though. <laughs> in those times, I've never been innocent. You know, the truth is the same as for all those brethren that are in heaven. Every one of them, while the accuser is there, knows that the reason they're innocent is because an innocent lamb was sacrificed, slain on their behalf, and that they received his position. Friend, the accuser's a liar. You're innocent. You're innocent. There are individuals who have bought into this tactic by the devil, which is to say, you're terrible, you're wicked, you are. And then, then the fact is, is that he has all the facts supporting his case, he's just leaving out. He's just leaving out the, the most significant event, and that is that your penalty was paid in full by Jesus Christ. And... Believers are many times supplanted by hearing the accusation and realizing it's true. But forgetting that as far as God's concerned, it isn't. See, God's the judge. See, He's the accuser, but He's not the judge. And you know, your sinful flesh, you might accuse yourself, but you're also not the judge. God is. And one of the keys to spiritual victory is to recognize who the judge is. The devil's not the accuser. He's the accuser. He's not the judge. You might be an accuser and not the judge, but it's God who's the judge. And His verdict is universally, for those that have received Jesus, innocent. Amen. Literally, the brethren who are in heaven, heaven listen to heaven. Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of His Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. What a triumph. What a victory. Even during a time of terrible persecution, terrible tribulation, even at a time when it would seem as though the world, of course, they're in torment, of course, the wicked are in a lot of trouble. 
But you know, even the believers that are part of this tribulation period, here they are, they, they, they've been sequestered, they've been hidden away in the wilderness for a time. Protected. You want to feel like, man, all is lost. No. The devil's thrown down and we're still here. But guess what? The accuser of the brethren is cast down. You and I need to have a right perspective about this dragon, don't we? We'll see him again in chapter 13 uh, when we're there next week. Now I want to look down um, at one more thing, verse 12, or verse 11, I'm sorry, overcoming. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Now this is, this is fantastic. This is just absolutely incredible. You know, the word overcome here, you know it's a word for conquer. Same word is used for conquer. Now that's an incredible way to describe sinners and Satan. Isn't it? That's an incredible way to describe me and you and the devil. Conquered? Well, the Bible says they overcame Him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto the death. Okay, there are two things here we find in this passage of Scripture in order to overcome. The first area a believer overcomes. See, oftentimes we think of overcoming and we substitute in our minds the word overcome with the word escape. And the word here is not overscape. Overscape. I just made another one. Man, I could be. I could be a bush. I could be George W. Bush, and <laughs> with those words that come up. If, if I, as long as I don't misunderestimate my ability, uh, that's a that's a W word, isn't it? Misunderestimate. What was that? I, I already forgot my word. Anyway, uh, overcome is not escape. It's not even overscape or underscape. The reality of it is, is that. The word is not escape, the word is conquer. And that, my friend, is more significant than oftentimes we ponder upon, isn't it? Amen. Your victory is bigger than you wiggling out of a problem. Your victory is the devil's defeat. You hear me now? As I ponder this passage of Scripture, I hear in my words, God's words to Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? <laughs> There's none like him in all the earth. He loves God. He hates evil. Satan, I'll bet Job, I'll bet he really has put a whooping on you, hadn't he? That's literally what God was saying. Job was a thorn in the dragon's side. Isn't that amazing? Listen, I don't know about you, but there's in me a little inherent delight in being obnoxious sometimes. <laughs> to the devil! You ever met somebody that just like, I just like to just, you know, torment, just, just to kind of... Um, I'm going to tell you something. Nothing bothers this, the devil more than your victory. And I did not say your escape. I did not say you're weaseling out of a situation. I said your victory over him. Through the blood of the Lamb. We never must, re, uh, we never must uh, forget the source of our victory. But friend, victory is not the same as you know, neutrality. You know, you don't want to uh, you don't want to come out with a truce, right? You, victory is unconditional surrender for you, and that literally is God's idea, God's plan, God's purpose in the life of a believer. He wants you to be victorious. There's nothing arrogant about that. There's no person who has victory that would say, "Man, look what I've done." The first way that you and I can conquer, the first way that you and I can overcome, my friend, is through the blood of the Lamb, through Jesus Christ. 
I like the song. It was pretty popular back in the 90s in a lot of churches, but we are more than conquerors through Him that loved us so. The Christ who dwells within us is the greatest power we know. And uh, what a great, very, very victorious song. I like the way it was sung. Just a very, you know, powerful anthem for victory. And friend, you and I, the word overcomer is not escaper. It's overcomer. I think sometimes we, you know, we've softened the term a little bit and made it a little bit, had taken some of the sass out of it, if you will. Let's just put it back. Victory is ours. The second way that the believers overcame was by the testimony. By their testimony. Look at that for a second. By the word of their testimony. And in the, there's a side note, they love not their lives unto death. But the, the last thing we'll look at today is that the word of their testimony. What is testimony? What is testimony? What's to testify of, right? You know, there's nothing more obnoxious to the Satan. There's nothing that puts him down more than someone testifying. What do we testify of? Jesus. Jesus. My friend, one of the most powerful things that a believer can do is to testify of Jesus. Why is it so important? To testify, of course, there's an assumption, isn't there? Testimony? That we have a testimony? That testimony is personal. It's about what Jesus has done with me personally. And your testimony is so powerful. So you and I think that our testimony is powerful in the sense that it enables others or it uh, thrills others. I have a hard time watching like, um, you know, feel good movies. Because I'm too emotional. I cry easy. You know, and I just, I just it can't, it's embarrassing. I have to watch them by myself so I can just let the tears flow and nobody will see me. That sort of thing. But the reality of it is, is that there's just something about testimony. It's not to, our testimony is not to thrill others. Our testimony is to declare the power of Jesus Christ. Amen. To testify the power of Jesus Christ. Not only in our lives, but for others. There's nothing more effective than a testimony in defeating the devil. You know, sometimes we say, well, you know what, I'll share my testimony, but I need to, you know, I need to work on some things. I need to make sure that I have more victory. You know something, my friend? Mm -hmm. Your testimony is part of your victory. There's two ways that you destroy the devil. Through the blood of the Lamb and through the testimony. You won't have victory without testifying of it. Pastor, I feel like a hypocrite when I testify. I feel like, you know, hey, listen, there's never been a worthy individual who's testified. Do you hear me today? There's never been a worthy individual who's testified, but there's never been a victorious person who hasn't testified. Do you hear me? There's never been a victorious person who will not testify. And I think sometimes as believers, we don't remember that. Or we don't understand the value of it, the importance of it. Paint yourself in the corner with your testimony. <laughs> By the grace of God, I'll never go ahead. Testify. If I have victory the rest of my life, it'll be because of Jesus and the power of the blood of the Lamb. The reason today I stand before you is because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Testify of Jesus and then testify of His effect in your life. You know, a lot of believers, they just, well, you know what, I, uh, I don't have very good testimony. Come back with that for a second, will you please? Could you explain to me how the blood of the Lamb isn't something that's a good testimony? Start your topic off right. When you testify, don't say, well, you know, I had a bad background, and, uh, you know, everything was against me, and it looked like I didn't stand a chance of making it in life, but praise the Lord, I pulled myself up by my bootstraps, and I determined that I was not going to quit, and I was not going to fail, and the devil would not defeat me. And so I went ahead and called on Jesus, and I did all these amazing things after. No. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's, I was lost and dead in the trespasses of sins. And sins. And, but Jesus came. And now I have overcome. 
Nikao, conquered. I've conquered the devil <laughs> by the blood of the Lamb and by the testimony, by the word of... The Bible says he was conquered by the word of their testimony. And the Bible says about people like that, they love not their lives unto the death. Well, that's as far as we're going here today. I know it's just kind of a microcosm of the context of the text. But you know, it's really important for us to really look at this scene in heaven. There's a reason the Holy Spirit of God made such an impression on John and told him, write this down. It's because there's a nugget here for you, Christian. There's victory here for you. I did not say there's escape for you here. I said there's victory here for you as a believer. Make it a study. I suggest to you when we have a passage of Scripture like this that you memorize it. Uh, that at least you get to know it so well in its context that you always know where it's at in your Bible and you'll be able to loosely misquote it. Memorize it. Know it. And make it part of your life and testify because the testimony is so important. By the way, isn't that unique how God will take a series that we're in and make it kind of fit with the day uh, that it's in? Here we are on a day of Thanksgiving. You know what, test, what Thanksgiving is? Giving thanks? It's really testifying a lot, isn't it? And isn't it incredible how we would see an example like this on a day like this? It's no accident, no mistake the way that the Spirit of God works. Father, I pray that You would help us as believers to not only be certain and settled about future events, God, help us to be afraid for the lost, but God, help us in the right way to see how that we can overcome not just evil, the dragon, the devil, through the blood of the Lamb and through the word of our testimony. God, I look forward to this day when I'm in heaven with you and when this moment in time comes and this great shout rises up in heaven, I look forward to being a host, part of a host that testifies and rejoices at the Satan's demise. Thank you for what we've learned today. Please help us to apply it. Pray in Jesus' name. Before we finish our prayer this morning, I want to ask you to do me a favor, and that would be just, if we could just have a moment in our service for you to keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. And I would just like to have uh, a little bit of time to make application of the Word of God here this morning. This would be a time where we call normally in our service the invitation. Invitation, if you're not accustomed to it, will be a time when if God's actually spoken to you and He's shared, shown you truth and convinced you of it, and it has shown you that there's something in your life that isn't what God wants it to be, something needs to change, the invitation is a time that we invite you to go ahead and make that decision that the Holy Spirit has, has uh, prompted you about in the service. So if you could bow your heads at this time and just close your eyes briefly. I'd like to have a private time with every person here. And it's important for the sake of others that you not look around because every person here needs to have privacy. The first question I want to ask this morning uh, is, is perhaps the most important question you could be asked in your life. That's the matter of your eternal destiny. Uh, specifically, do you know that you have eternal life? Now, I did not ask today if you hope that you have eternal life or that if you're spiritual and aware uh, that there's a God and so forth. But I'm talking about do you know that you've received eternal life because of what Jesus did when He died for your sins on the cross? Are you saved? Could you confidently say that you know that you have eternal life because you've received Jesus as your Savior? If you're here and that question is one that you'd say, well, I, I have some questions about the question, probably the simple answer this morning could be that that's a matter that you've not yet settled. And could I say to you that there's no better time and there's nothing simpler that could be settled than that? You're here this morning you say, Pastor, uh, pray for me. I'm not certain that I have eternal life. I want to. I want to be a conqueror. But I'm not sure that I am. If that's you and you're here this morning, would you just slip your hand up? I won't call you out. won't embarrass you. wouldn't do that for the world. But Pastor, pray for me. I'm not certain about the matter of eternal life and uh, I, I know that's important. Okay, anybody here for that? Second question is this one. You're here this morning and you say, Pastor, you know, I've been wrong about the way that I've thought about the Satan. I've been wrong about the way that I've thought about spiritual victory. I've seen myself sometimes more as a prisoner who's trying to escape than an individual who's able to conquer. And I think that my thinking about that and 
and uh, the fact that I have not seen the importance of my testimony, I think that that's been a hindrance in my life. In the past, I believe I've not had victory because of the way that I've thought about those two things. And God's just plainly opened my eyes about that today. And uh, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and commit to God that I'm going to thank His way about these two things. That's you in here this morning. You saw that from the Word of God. Just slip your hand up. Just slip your hand up. Away of encouragement. Yeah, slip them right back down. Thank you. Slip them right up, right back down. Okay, so you've told me. Let's take a minute in our service and have the opportunity to tell God. We're going to go ahead and sing a song of invitation uh, that we sang this morning, page 246. And uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask that everybody stand to your feet if you're physically able to do so. And, if you're, and while we sing the, the hymn of invitation, if you have something to tell God in regard to the response to the message today, would you just do that uh, before we conclude our service here today? Page 246, softly and tenderly, and we'll just sing it. And while we sing it, if you want to do business with the Lord, you feel the freedom to do that. You can either remain sitting uh, in your seat, or if you'd like to kneel there, or if you need someone to pray with you, I'm available for that as well. Softly and tenderly, page 246. Before we dismiss our service, let me remind you first that we do close services, but the invitation is never closed. God's never finished with you so long as you have breath. As long as you're breathing, uh, you have, you're, you're a recipient of God's mercy, and He's merciful for the purpose of your turning to Him. If you need help with something, or you see, if you need answers for something, uh, sometimes a message that's preached generates more questions than it gives answers. And if that's so, we have time for that. We would be glad to open a Bible and share with you or help you to be able to find answers. Also, uh, we're available for you if you're concerned about the matter of your eternal life. We certainly would love the opportunity to show you how that you can know confidently that you're born again, that, that to heaven's your eternal home, and you'll be part of these saints who are part of the victorious chorus. Um, let me just give a couple of words about uh, this afternoon. Because we'll be in Miami Beach for the praise service, we will not have time to be back in time for uh, the evening service up here this evening. And so uh, we've never really canceled. One other time when we were doing a, a Miami Beach service, we didn't have a Sunday night service up here. So that's unusual, and I want to let you know about that in case you're planning on being here for the 6 p.m. service. But uh, we're expecting that everyone can go uh, to be part of the services this afternoon with the understanding that some cannot for various reasons. If you need help with transportation, uh, we the bus always leaves at about uh, five minutes after one. But please don't be so pharisaical and put the law on me with that that you get mad if we leave earlier. Okay, here's the deal. The bus leaves as soon as it gets back from uh, dropping the kids off, but we try never to leave later than 105 because we cannot predict what will happen with traffic. And also we stop at Taco Bell drive through on the way down to get some Taco Bell. So if you want to put in an order, if you want to ride with us and put in an order for Taco Bell, come see me, I can help you with that. And uh, then we'll be going down there, and then we'll be, again, uh, having our praise Thanksgiving pie services. Thanks for the folks that brought such beautiful pies. Man, I'll tell you what, we're going to have a great time this afternoon. I have no problem praising when there's pie at all. I don't have a problem praising either anyway, but just, just something festive about pie. You know, you could cut uh, just about any aspect of a preaching service, but if you cut the preaching, I won't feel like I've been to church. And you can cut anything out of Thanksgiving service, but if our Thanksgiving uh, servings and the meals, but if you cut the pie, I won't feel like it's Thanksgiving. So uh, we're going to have a great time this afternoon. If you have any questions or need help with that, uh, let us know, and we'll plan on convening in Miami Beach here in just a little while. Uh, if you're not able to go, 
Uh, God bless you. Thank you so much for being here. And we're all dismissed. I want to ask Charlie if you'll dismiss us with prayer. Can we please? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Uh, Lord, for these truths uh, concerning being an overcomer. Lord, I pray that you would just grip our hearts. I pray in particular, Lord, that this week uh, we would be able to not only uh, apply uh, with what we've learned also, Lord, but that you would bring divine appointment into our path or to be able to share uh, of your goodness uh, and that we, we would be able to see someone saved even this week. Now I pray, Lord, that you uh, would dismiss us with your blessing and that, that we would be able to make it safely uh, not only down a uh, great, wonderful service where you work mightily, uh, but even uh, at home back up later in the evening. I praise in Jesus' name. Amen.